Good evening, everybody. Welcome to The Money Date. Today, I want to talk about how do you make sense and where do you save your hard-earned dollars, whether it's going to be in your pre-tax or your after-tax accounts. That's the discussion for the day. I hope you enjoy in your week. I'm excited to be here. My name is Anna, and our weekly Money Dates are about giving ourselves a pause and reflecting back on how we've done with our finances. And so uh, the song for today's episode is It's a Beautiful Life. I don't know if many of you are familiar with the European uh, band called Ace of Bass. It's very old. It's from the 80s, early 90s. This is when I um, was growing up back in Europe. Hi, Linda. Good to have you here. Awesome. Thanks for joining. So, life's beautiful and I do want to talk about um, our finances. So, my friends, um, let's just see. Something is going on here on my camera, but okay. I hope you guys can see me. Let me know if you can't. Um, okay, so money dates. Before we get into the actual meat discussion about today's topic, I want to send you uh, just a, one short reminder, but you know what my reminder is for those of you watching live, I need you to reflect back on how your last week has been. How have you done in terms of your income? Do you actually know how much money you've made? How have you done in terms of your expenses? Where did you spend your money over the last seven days? And how are you staying on target with your goals? Because we all need to have goals. But if we don't keep track, and I'm always asking you to do that, um, then how are you gonna know if you're making any progress? And that's the whole idea, is for you to realize that going to work isn't about um, just that. Going to work allows you to achieve your dreams, right? And so having a system that you can track and put in place is something you, you can do. Thanks for watching. Hi, Alberto. Good to have you here. Sorry, I'm putting my head to the side because somehow my screen flipped. Anyway, I hope you're still seeing me <laughs> in the right direction. So that is my reminder, okay? You guys need to know exactly where things are. I'm always advocating for passive systems. I'm always advocating for keeping very easy, short kind of, you know, distance. And that's why weekly check-in for money dates is all about. Now you guys also, and as you're hopping on, thanks for joining me. Um, good to have you here, Alberto. So how about, um, as you're hopping on, say hello. And then as, as you guys pop in, in the chat, let me know how things have been for you in terms of the last week. Uh, but all I'm really asking for is, um, your money wins. You guys know I love to talk about winning. You guys know I like to talk about gratitude and appreciation. So I've got to combine these two topics, especially when, you know, all day uh, in my conversations, it's all, always about somebody else's finances. So how can we find a space? And that's what I'm talking about, a space in your mind to give yourself a pause to reflect and, and be appreciative of what life brings to you. And so mine is, and I'll share mine, I'd love to know what yours are. Um, mine is for the last week, and so I do this with you on a weekly basis, but of course for me it's um, on a daily basis, right? So keep it in gratitude journal. But mine has been, and it's been kind of brewing for a while. L Linda, I think you would appreciate this quite a bit, and I'm happy to talk more about it. This is just more of a, in general, kind of sharing what I'm doing. But I've been really passionate um, about um, the fact that there's not enough women in my industry. In financial space, financial services, there are just not enough women. It's a sad, sad statistic. Um, it's uh, just about under 25%. And so I've been on a mission to help more women do what I do because I find it to be a very rewarding career. I find it to be a very rewarding type of thing. And so I've um, been working on organizing some get togethers for, for women that I already know that are you know, colleagues in this space. And so you know, out of that, something big is kind of coming out. But for now, this is, this is all I'm going to uh, share with you. So I want, what I want is to have more women in my space. I want to get, get more women introduced to this area. And how can, the goal is how can we together, how, be, how can we connect? 
how can we grow together, and then how can we serve others? Because that's at the end of the day what we do with our clients, don't we, Linda? <laughs> so that's why I said um, you would definitely agree. So I'm, expe I'm especially excited. Uh, two weeks from now, I have a first one of the first. This is actually my second event. I did one last year. I'm going to be in, in Colorado, Denver area, and um, so that group is um, all kind of getting together. So more on that to come, but I'm excited because I've been working on it like really heavily the last couple of weeks, and it's all coming together. So um, that's mine, but I'd love to hear what you guys are appreciative about and how you see your finances, because it's not just about the numbers. It is really not. Um, and I am the type of advisor who looks at this from kind of a, a different lens, right? Yes, we have to talk about the numbers. We're talking about pre-tax and after-tax accounts today. I mean, I think it's a pretty straightforward topic, but I think <laughs> we can clarify some things. Um, but we've got to look at this from a different angle. We've got to look at our life as something that's, you know, consists of a lot of different facets. And so gratitude and appreciation and, and reflection is a big part of that and unfortunately it all ties in together so I've got to see it anyway I um, I love you uh, I love you guys joining me sorry it's kind of funny but I have to read my comments sideways I don't know why <laughs> um, share this out I appreciate you um, watching live and I appreciate you watching your play so let's get into the actual topic I always get these questions about well what is the difference between Pre-tax accounts, or where should I save my money? Do I put it in a pre-tax account? Hi, Gordon, good to have you here. Versus do I put it in an after-tax account? So I wanna run down through both of these for you guys to understand the difference because it's, it's, about, um, it's about having clarity there because then you can make smart decisions. So um, yeah, Linda shared hers. Hers is connecting with friends. Um, this week, yeah, it's awesome. I've actually been following your uh, awesome pictures, um, so yeah, I appreciate that uh, on Facebook, Linda, and Instagram. So let's get let's get started with talking about after-tax monies first, right? So um, after-tax money means you get a paycheck or you get an income, you pay the tax on that money, right, and then you do something else with it. One thing, of course, you can spend it. The other thing is you can start thinking about saving it in, in certain vehicles, right? And so what I want to talk about, what actually happens to that money, right? You can put it in a different type of account. You can put it in a savings account. You can open an investment account. But what happens as that money multiplies and grows for you? So um, the number one thing to remember is you start out that kind of account. What do you put into that account, right? Your original contribution is called cost basis or the principal. And so uh, some of you who are watching our clients and know that we always ask for cost basis for all of our, from our, all of our clients when we do an analysis and reviewing how their after-tax accounts are doing, right? Because what it comes down to in knowing how well you're doing is, know, is to know how much money you actually put into that account, looking at what it's done. Has it grown? over the years, right? Or has it lost, has it gone down in value? And so cost basis or original amount allows you to keep that kind of track. But what it also allows us to do is actually calculate what's the gain and then out of that figure out what kind of tax consequence you're actually going to have. So here's the flow. The money goes, that goes into this after-tax account has a special type of tax treatment as opposed to pre-tax type of account. And I'll talk about pre-tax in just a little bit, but money that, that is taxed or gains that are taxed that are coming out of this after-tax account are going to be taxed either, right, or either based on how much dividends, right, dividends is the income that, that comes out of that, or interest you get. So if you had a savings account, you're going to get 2%. This is the highest um, today we can get. You're going to get 2% interest rate. That interest rate is going to be taxed at what's called capital gains rates. Ordinary income tax rates apply to income that you get through paycheck, but also the income that we get to take and receive from our after, from, I'm sorry, from our pre-tax accounts. So one of the features of having an account like that, it could be an investment account, it could be a savings account, is that 
you get to actually pay less taxes. Generally, and you guys know we have kind of a like progressive tax system in the United States, so there are different levels of taxes, right? So different brackets. So I, for the simplicity of today's discussion, let's say that any gain you have that's coming out of those accounts is gonna be taxed at 15% tax rate. There's, there's, there's chances that you maybe pay zero taxes, right, depending on what your tax bracket is. And remember, actually, this year we got a whole new um, revision of our tax brackets. So some of you might be even in a lower tax bracket. But on average, you need to think and remember, right, maybe depending on your income, maybe 15% is what you'll pay. And that's a federal tax. Some states or most states have state tax. So not only you pay the, the, the state tax, uh, a federal tax, but you also pay state tax. I am proud to tell you that in California, we pay the most. <laughs> so I'm being sarcastic here, as you can tell, um, because I have no choice. <laughs> so it's a, um, uh, some of us call that a sunshine tax. And so for those of you who want to uh, join us in California, you need to be prepared to pay a sunshine tax. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a joke, but what I mean is that you pay higher taxes uh, because California state taxes are generally higher than across um, other states uh, in, in our country. So, so think about that. You've got, you've got your original basis, you invested, you could be, let's say you set up an investment account and you bought a few stocks, right? And so over time they've grew um, to some kind of amount and then you're ready to sell them. So when you look back and you say, okay, what is it that I'm gonna pay taxes on? You look at your basis, you look at how much profit you've made, and then you decide whether you're gonna sell it, right? Hopefully it's not uh, something that you're gonna sell at a loss, which happens uh, often enough. Um, or maybe you sell some of your losers and you sell some of your winners and you offset the gains. So, but you pay a, a, a capital gains taxes. The other thing that happens every year, you're going to get a t something called a 1099 form in the mail. So a custodian is a company where you have your account. Um, it could be a Schwab, it could be Fidelity, it could be you know, a bank, it could be all kinds of things. Uh, timing the market. I don't know what you mean, Alberto. I don't think we have a crystal ball. <laughs> um, I'm still looking for one. Um, so a custodian is somebody who holds your account. And so that company is going to send this 1099 form. They're gonna mail you a copy and they're gonna mail you one to the IRS, okay? And so that way, when you're completing your tax return, this information can be double checked by the IRS because you know, they wanna get their fair share of taxes, okay? Now, the other point, the last point to make about the taxable accounts is that you get to, hi Chelsea, good to have you here. Oh, cliche, I'm sorry. I'm reading sideways, good to have you here. Um, thanks for joining. Um, hopefully you got my little wave here. So um, the types of investments that you can think about in terms of uh, these after-tax accounts, it could be, as I mentioned, as simple as your checking account, as simple as your savings account, money market, but anything that goes into your investment account starting from stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds, and so forth, um, any of those types of investments can go in those accounts, okay? Now, a lot of times my clients like to think about those types of accounts is, um, is, is something that may be more of short-term to mid-term kind of um, allocation. And we talked about, hi there, good to have you here. Hi Sarah, good to have you here. Um, and we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we talked about our buckets. You, you guys remember, I like the idea of short-term monies, uh, I like the idea of mid-term monies, and I like the idea of the longer-term monies. Depending what your timeline is, right, where you are in your life phase, um, maybe the bucket two, so bucket one for short, bucket two for mid-term for mid, for mid goals, and bucket three for long-term goals, you have, um, you could think of your after-tax money sort of being set up in buckets two and three. It can be across, but it's kind of like giving you a little bit of a guideline, okay? So we got out of the way our after-tax monies. We kind of have an idea and understanding why we would want to invest in something like that. Emergency fund, here is something I can give you a real life example. Emergency fund is something that will go into your after-tax uh, type of an account, right? So it's just one of the examples. Okay, let's chat about uh, pre-tax accounts. 
you guys, a lot of clients think that just because it's pre-tax, and this is kind of that notion that I like a lot of you to get away from. When you make a, dec a decision about an investment, it shouldn't be solely based, and I hope it's not when you're doing that, shouldn't be solely based on what's the tax impact or what's the tax consequence is going to be. It is one of the pieces of the equation, but it's not a sole one and it's not the first one to look at, okay? And so that's where you start differentiating between where do I put my money in? Now, with pre-tax types of accounts or tax deferred accounts, there are restrictions, there are a lot more rules and limitations around what can happen. So what I'm talking about here are your retirement types of accounts, 401k, 43B, 457, uh, TSP, that's a thrift savings plan for, for those clients who are, work for federal government, IRA, simple IRA, SEP IRA, there's all kinds of other ones, SEP, so those are sort of the, the main categories, but what these accounts allow you to do is they allow you to defer your income pre-tax. So if you work for an employer, right, if you have a, a, a company that you work for, they allow you to put money in, into that account before taxes so your paycheck gets reduced by that amount okay now if you are like me who are self-employed we also have i own a business right um, we also have small businesses also are allowed to have these types of retirement plans right because just like everybody else <laughs> we got to work on saving for our own retirement so you can have a retirement plan where through the business you can put money away the idea is that all it allows you to do is to save for retirement, which is number one. That's what we want to keep our eyes, right, our focus. Number two, because it's pre-tax, it allows you to reduce your taxable income. So all that paycheck you're getting allows you to reduce that taxable income in the calendar year that you're making contributions, right? Or for the calendar year, you're completing your tax return. So if you if you putting away, let's say let's lose yeah, let's use an example of a 401k. All, many of you are familiar with that. So let's say in 2018 we're allowed to put 18,500 in the 401k, right? And if you work for an employer, a lot of times employers offer a match. So let's say they're going to give you another 3% of your salary. So let's say if you make 100,000, you're going to get another 3,000 on a top of that. Now, of course, you can't do anything in terms of writing off or uh, the, th the match that you're getting from the employer, but at least, and if an example I'm given, if you make $100,000, you put 18 and a half, so the difference, right, is what is gonna be reported on your W-2, and that's what you're gonna pay taxes on. Hi, April, good to have you here. Thanks for watching. Um, hi, Sarah. Good to have you here too. So um, what I'm trying to point out to you is that it is not only useful for long-term planning, right, saving for retirement, but it's also understanding what happens with, with the money that goes into, our, into those, those accounts. So with the pre-tax money, right, there's a lot more restrictions in terms of how and what you can do because the goal is to keep it there longer so that you can generate more and grow it and use it for retirement, right? So there's, it's not, the, the, the limitations of those accounts is that they're not as easy to tap into as opposed to the ones we talked about at the beginning, right? That your savings account, you can tap in into any time. Your investment account, you can tap into at any time. There are restrictions. There are, if you take money out before you turn 59 and a half, there are penalties. If you take money, 10% penalty, my friends. If you take money, um, out of those accounts, you pay taxes as well, just like we do with um, with pre-tax money, uh, after-tax monies. But you pay taxes. This is the difference. You pay taxes um, based on what's called ordinary income tax rate, based on the income tax rate that you're going to pay on all of your income. So let's say you're getting a paycheck, your salary is $100,000 a year, and you take a distribution from your 401k plan for whatever reason, right? Um, all that income is going to get added on the top of 100000 and all of a sudden, maybe you're going to be even pushed into the higher tax bracket. So n all of this is fine. I just want you to understand kind of the structure of how, how these things progress, right? And when you're making a decision, right, where to save your money, because my advice to you, if the bottom line is that you need to have 
combination of, of all of this, right? Because what I find, and this is interesting too, Linda, you probably see this a lot with your clients, is that most of you have a lot of your monies in the pre-tax account, right? And then when it comes down to things like, all right, buying, uh, buying a house or doing certain things, a lot of you fall short because you haven't thought through, right? Because we're all running after like, okay, you know, max out your retirement accounts because we, we have a big goal of getting through the retirement, which is fine. But if we think about, right, that's why the whole discussion, so this whole month of July, we've been talking about investments. And so that's why I started with you and getting, again, your mind wrapped around the buckets. Like if we have short-term needs, we aren't putting this money in our tax deferred accounts, right? We, we aren't doing that because it's not benefiting us uh, right now. But it may be, hi Brad, Good to have you here but maybe we're doing that uh, for the long run so that is um, uh, exactly Linda is pointing out that many of you actually aren't even diversified but it's like oh my gosh I'm not even going there <laughs> on this discussion because it's another um, another good topic for a different show so what I want you guys to understand is again come back and ask yourself a question, what is the goal I'm trying to accomplish? Once you know what that goal, and hopefully you know your timeline, it becomes much, much easier to sort out where that money goes, right? We are, the big thing that I'm always, always, always asking you to do is to know what your, save, what your expenses and income is every week, and therefore you probably have a good idea in staying on top with uh, tracking what your uh, savings goals are. And so hopefully your savings goals are going into a different savings amount for those goals, are going into a different uh, tax, uh, into, into a different uh, bucket, whether it's pre-tax or after tax. So those are the kind of main differences. There's lots more to talk about, um, you know, when, when we get into the actual discussion. I mean, one of, the, one of the points to make earlier that Linda said is that a lot of you aren't diversified, but diversification also kind of plays into this equation because maybe sometimes, in, in, as, as we believe that in the shorter term needs, right, we don't need to be investing. Hi, Tony. Hi, hi Brain. Good to have you here. Um, we don't need to be investing in anything aggressive. So the diversification piece does has to happen across all of your accounts. So it's not only about pre-tax, after-tax. It's also about the short the, the timeline that you have, and it's the goals that you're trying to accomplish. So um, remember also that the other thing too is with the with the after-tax monies, you're getting your 1099 at the end of the year. Um, with your retirement accounts, you're not. And that's kind of like one of the attractive features, right? You get to, you get to deduct the contributions on your um, taxes. You um, don't pay uh, any, any taxes on the gain until you're actually starting taking distributions. And so um, you don't get the 1099, right? But what happens a lot of times, and this is something to think about, Alberta, I think you would appreciate this point, is that we talk about diversification, right? We talk about spreading our eggs into lots of different baskets, right? That's the whole idea of diversification. But when it comes down to a phase, a retirement phase, where you're not accumulating, you're actually starting to distribute from, from, from your various accounts, what I actually see a lot too is that most clients are heavy on the retirement accounts, therefore the type of income that they're getting is all taxed at ordinary income tax rates. Plus on the top of that you get your social security and maybe you have a pension. And so income diversification in retirement also plays a big role because if you have a variety right, of these types of accounts, you can actually you know, work on creating a strategy where you have you pay less taxes, right? So I just wanted to drop that out there because I think we get so focused on tax, uh, pre-tax, you know, retirement, 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 and we find ourselves years later, which is, I mean, I applaud a lot of you for doing heavy lifting and, and working on savings, but then we find ourselves as like, wow, I wish I knew that maybe I should have been saving in my Roth IRA account and my after-tax account some, sometime, um, and then not been so heavily focused on retirement, even though those monies will be servicing um, that purpose. So that's all I've got for you guys today. I was thinking about what kind of quote I want to share, and I, it's been kind of interesting. We're almost at the end of July, and it's like 
summer is in the peak, right? Um, all the way, you know, from coast to coast. Even though it's like I'm wearing a, a light jacket because it's, it's still kind of cool here in San Francisco Bay Area um, in the morning. And I walk to, um, uh, to the office. Yes, uh, I agree, Alberta, that also uh, one of the advantages or maybe disadvantages about retirement accounts, <coughs> especially the ones that are tax deferred, is that you're going to be forced to take distributions. Uh, from those accounts when you turn 70 and a half. And so uh, whether you want it or not, um, you're going to have to do it because our, uh, our favorite Uncle Sam uh, wants his share of your taxes. And so as far as going back to the quote, I was thinking, like, what do I want to talk about? And I found this interesting. It's a very short, but I think it's sweet and to the point. Um, I, you know, I was thinking the summer, when I was, when I was younger, I would... Um, I would always think about, especially when you were, you know, when you're in school or when you were in college, you're like, okay, you kind of your schedule is sort of goes from you're in school and then you have summer break and then you go back to school in the fall and so forth, right? You have winter break and spring breaks. And I, you know, when I was younger, I was was used to think like, I don't want to have that kind of schedule. Like, I want to be, you know, a professional. I want to be working. I want to be able to take time off, not just in the summer, but in the winter and then at, like any time of the year. Um, but then, you know, I kind of started to miss that point, right? Because now it, 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 it's kind of all over and it doesn't make sense. But one thing that really came, uh, caught my attention was this quote, and it says is that summer is a state of mind. Um, and it's, I, I don't know who uh, came up with this quote. It's an unknown author. But I actually want you to think about that. I want you to have a summer state of mind, whether it's um, hot outside and we're all complaining about um, how miserable we are or... Um, it's it's going to be you know three or four or five months from now when we're going to get a ton of snow. I still want you to have a summer state of mind. Thanks for joining me tonight. I'm sorry I keep uh, tilting my head, um, but I will figure this out <laughs> for the next round. I hope this information is useful. And please, if you haven't done your weekly check-in, if you haven't had your money date, um, go get it because. That's the only way you're going to know whether you are staying on track and you're accomplishing um, what you set to accomplish. And so I appreciate you watching. Linda, good to have you here. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.